Good evening, everyone. It's just wonderful to see such a great turnout for uh, tonight's um, visit where we're zooming over to the Outer Hebrides, to the Isle of Burnaray, overlooking the Sound of Harris. Um, I am the Chair of Friends and Development for the RSA, so I get to bore you all for a little bit And before I hand over to Keith. Um, I've actually known Keith for a very long time, um, and I'm just delighted that he has become um, a relatively recent member of the Royal Scottish Academy. Um, he uh, was trained at Duncan of Jordanston um, a wee while ago. Uh, he has taught at Glasgow School of Art and for about the last 27 years at the University of Northumberland where in, in Newcastle, where he's been heading up the um, School of Art. But quite apart from all his academic work and encouragement of amazing groups of students, he has an absolutely thriving practice of his own work, which involves making many large-scale drawings, installations. He, he has worked right across different media in theater and in film and so on and so forth. Um, about two and a half years ago, um, Keith um, moved over to uh, his where he is now in the Isle of Burnery in the Outer Hebrides. And the space that you're going to see tonight is a beautiful, um, in a way, it's uh, Keith and the studio, I think, are both the subject of tonight's talk. And um, I'm, I'm sure that Keith can put everything far better than me. So with no further day, ado, um, I welcome Keith McIntyre. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'll say Felcha go Bernara, which is in Gaelic, but welcome to Bernari. Um, uh, I, I will also just give you a heads up that we're, we're quite far north here and and the sun is starting to, to set in the Atlantic, literally behind that wall. So as the light starts to go, I'll keep an eye on things in the background, but um, there are some other lights I can put on just in case it, it gets dark. Um, so once again, thank you, Kate. Thank you, Elena, for kind of organizing tonight. Um, yeah, my name's Keith McIntyre. Uh, I, what I want to do tonight is just give you a kind of a, an overview of current and recent work. Uh, Essentially, I want to weave that into the story of the studio because, you know, the thing that, that always excited me when I was a little kid, actually, when I saw the RSA, because I'm from Edinburgh, I grew up in Edinburgh. Um, it, it was, a, my grandfather was telling me about architecture and it's actually architecture was the pathway that excited me at first. So in a sense, there's a kind of reversal of things at this stage of my career. I've been working, collaborating with the architect Derek Patience to build this place. And, and also a number of other studios. Um, so, so anyway, welcome to the, the, the studio. Uh, this building, um, and maybe, maybe what would be good, because we do still have the light, um, I, I wonder if I just do you a quick, a quick tour of the space, just so you get an idea of what we've got here. Um, this building was a Thomas Telford Parliamentary Church, and um, it, it, um, it, it basically was commissioned back in about 1819, 1817 and completed then. I'm going to show you some photographs of it in a second, but just to give you a kind of quick overview of the space, um, it is quite large. Um, uh, and when you see the slides, you'll realize the state that we got it in. Um, so it's become a kind of operational studio for me. It's also an operational studio for my, my wife, the, the artist, Sheena Patience. And, um, uh, yeah, I hope you just get a sense of the scale of the place um, just from these shots. I'm doing this now because the light might start to go. I don't know if you can see just out there the sound of Harris, and that's Harris over in the distance. So the croft that we're on um, extends down to the east beach of Bern, if anyone knows that, just in front of us here. And, and so Harris is it's a good guide of the weather. You can see Harris in the morning. It's okay, but you can't see it. Well, it's the end of the day. Um, I'm wondering, Elena, could we actually show some of these slides and that will just give me a quick overview of, of what I've been doing recently and the story of the building. Yeah, of course. Just give me one second. Here we are. What I want to do is just give you a quick overview of some of the recent work. Some of this actually was shown in the archipelago show in the RSA. Um, and this is all work that was made here in the studio. 
One of the things that interests me is our folk culture and, and, in, and what I call narratology, the study of narrative. Um, and one of the things that's wonderful about the Isle of Bernary is they celebrate their new year in the old Julian chart. You know, here in the Isle of Bernary, we don't know, well, we have a new year on the 1st of January, but they actually follow the old Julian calendar, which is the 12th of January. And on that day, they celebrate a thing called Oike Kalan. And it's a celebration, Kalan's a new year, it's a celebration of the new year. And traditionally, the men used to walk around the island with masks on, disguise themselves, and they'd walk up to um, the houses and they would basically scare away the spirits for the new year. Um, so I was really interested in this, and this type of work where I just recycle bits of cardboard, bits of paint, build, build masks, this echoes a lot of the work that I've done in theatre and in collaboration with other performance companies. Can I get the next slide, please, Elena? And, and a number of themes will just kind of drive these, um, but essentially the practice that's been interesting me for the past week while is, is drawing and the potential offered by drawing. That you can take, make drawings, observe drawings, drawing as a way of understanding something, but then drawing as a way of articulating ideas. And, and, and I'm, I, I kinda, I'm, I'm pretty cheap, I like to use recycled materials, and there's a context for that. Many years ago, I had an opportunity to go to Cuba and do a, a residency and fellowship in Cuba for a while. And when I got to Havana, um, I, I said, where's the art material store? And they said, well, there's none. And very quickly, I learned to just recycle, as they do, uh, found materials. And, and I started with a bottle of black ink and some white card, and that was it. And I realized, actually, that, that was kind of going back to these very simple fundamentals that I could achieve things. So these are more of the Oike Callum pieces. Another one, thank you. And as I say, I'll, I'll actually show some of these. Some of these things are actually in the studio, so I can show you. I can show you them just as a, as a, you know, as an example of 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 the practice. But it's larking around, larking around with um, with with bits of car and paint, and and themes uh, and things you might find down the harbour, uh, fish or lobsters might be trans transcribed into paintings in the studio and then used. And so these are mainly like bits of foam board that I, I paint on and draw on. And then they're used as props um, in, in performative action. Uh, ne next slide, please. Yep. Um, the islands are very important to me. When I was a student at Duncan of Jordanston, I had an opportunity to come out to the Isle of Paul, which is an inner heavy. Um, and I was a real kind of Edinburgh town guy, and going out there on my motorbike was uh, an extraordinary experience. And so over the years, I've spent a lot of work uh, doing projects around the islands. This is a film uh, that, I, that I worked on with um, John Berger and uh, Tim Meat, who is Tim's a non-only fellow, I believe, of the, um, of the RSA, um, and a uh, really important person, uh, young emerging artists. Uh, but this film was made on the island of Inch Kenneth in, in the west of Mull. Um, and it's this kind of connectivity of filmmaking, of drawing, of making art and islands that really interests me. Next slide, please. So um, this is the location that I saw um, for the very first time when I, I came to the north end of Germany. Is there feedback on the... I'm getting feedback. Is that the Is that okay? If you can hear me, fine, that's fine. Um, so yeah, we, we drove up to the Isle of Bernary and we came across this ruined church and I was looking at the time to get basically a small bothy. It was my ambition to, to, to create a small bothy and work on it. And I was with an artist from the islands and I said, oh, you don't want that bothy, you want that big thing up on the hill. <laughs> um, and it, and, and it, it was one of these things, you walk into a space and the hair goes up in the back of your neck. Um, this we, we didn't know what it was at the time, but this was a ruined Thomas Telford Parliamentary Church. One of the churches that was commissioned uh, uh, back in about 1815 at the end of the um, Napoleonic Wars, um, some money was provided by the Parliament of London for church building um, in, the, in the remote parts of the Highlands and Islands of Scotland. And Telford was working up here that time and he said, could you come up with a basic uh, kit frame design, something that would just... And, and so he, he, he came up with this very simple um, T-shaped building uh, with large windows. It doesn't have any of the ecclesiastical style that uh, other churches were, were being built around that time. It's a very, very basic structural building, um, but hugely effective and, and easy to build. 
and a, t a kind of engineer solution to, to, to construction. Um, so this is, this is what we found. Uh, next slide, please. And, and the interior, it, and it's, it was truly beautiful and completely rock solid. And you can see from this photograph, my, my, my father's actually just standing in the doorway there. In fact, the doorway's just right behind me. And that's what we discovered, a, a building, a stone, beautiful stone building. Um, the, there were sheep inside it. The, the crofter here at the time was using it to keep his sheep in over the winter. Um, very complicated to explain why they took the roof off the building. They did that just at the end of the First World War. Um, but essentially the building was constructed and actually start, they started using it around about 1823, um, 1822, 1823. And um, just before the First World War, um, the community left here and built a free church. So they left the church of Skull and moved to the free church on the island. And the building after that was pretty much abandoned. And at one stage, partly to get spiteful, the Church of Scotland took the roof off it. They took the roof off it and they took all the timbers and materials and they're building another church in Scalpe, which is further north from here, uh, just off uh, Harris. Um, and so that, that the, all the materials from here are actually in another building over there. So this is what we found and then started the process of, of researching how we could develop it. The next slide, please. Um, a very important kind of, uh, uh, oh, been a great supporter to me and a great tutor was the artist Will McLean, um, another kind of uh, great, great, great member of the RSA. And Will, Will actually um, had a, a really valuable uh, portfolio of work gifted to him by uh, Neil Livingston, who was a retired engineer who was fascinated by the work of Telford. And this archive Will has gifted to us. So we have this archive here and it tells the story of all the 32 churches that were built in Scotland. It's a fantastic archive and uh, um, it, it's, it's here for anyone, any scholars or any architects or engineers want to come and see it. We've got it here in the studio and carefully look after it. But it tells the story of all the churches. They're all identical. They were essentially the first kit frame building churches built in Scotland at the time, or, or buildings at the time. Next slide, please. Uh, this is just given, if, if there's any architects here, just give me some idea of what we did. You can see this kind of building. It's an upside down T-shaped building. Um, and uh, these are the drawings from the architect Derek Patience who we collaborated with on to build this. Um, and uh, we wanted to keep as much space as possible. So if you look at the building, the, the space I'm in just now is pretty much all open plan and it's an open plan studio all the way up to the roof. And my wife has her studio space above me. Um, and what we have through the back is all the cosy stuff where we can sleep and keep warm. Um, but it is, a, it is a, a big functioning kind of operational space. Uh, next slide, please. Um, one of the things you can maybe just see in this image is the, uh, the cantilever um, roof that we've got floating, it's a balcony. And that came, that, the design for that actually came from finding a fishbone on the shore. Um, that I kind of showed this kind of fishbone to Derek Patience and I said, could you design a roof like that? And he kind of laughed and then, would you believe it, we saw these cantilever drawings. Um, and so the, the, the drawings, you know, it was a challenge for the, the, the joiners, two joiners who are from the islands actually built this place for us. Um, but uh, it, was, it, was worth, it was worth that, that strong design input and, and design intelligence as I think a really important thing when it comes to building studios. And I know that Kate, you've got a studio yourself, you've built recently. And it, it's so important that design intelligence going into mm, how, how we, we operate as artists, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, next slide, please. And so the studio's been used by not just us. We, um, there's this, a photograph of uh, the musician Julie Fowlis. Uh, she uses this wow. for recording. Um, there's been a number of uh, uh, bands who have come in here. The acoustics are, are very strong. I, I've done, over the years, I've spent a lot of time working in collaboration with theatre companies, filmmakers, um, as well as my kind of core studio practice. Um, so it's, it's, it's a place that kind of collaborative practice is kind of critical to what I do. And it's always good when other people can come and use the studio here as well. Next slide. Um, a few years ago, and I'm just putting these in to give you a sense of the scale of some of my drawings. Um, I, I, I got interested in a Gallic, a Gallic terminology called Molog. Molog is, um, means in praise of, um, and there's a great, the great, uh, Gaelic poet Duncan Van McIntyre. Um, he wrote this uh, this poem, very famous poem, Molog Bindoran, um, in praise of Bendoran. And Bendoran is a mountain 
um, which he lived, he grew up close by to it. And he wrote this epic, epic poem and song about Ben Doran. And um, I, anyway, I, I, long story short, uh, Murdo MacDonald, again, our honorary fellow of the RSA, Murdo um, was joking that, oh, maybe you're, a, maybe you're, you know, maybe you're related to Be uh, Duncan Van McIntyre. We did a bit of research and it's, it's possible that I am, because he ended up in Edinburgh and um, a, there's kind of connections that we've done, which there's a very strong chance that I, I, am, I am a descendant of him, which is fascinating. But this Molog thematic interests me. And, and consequently, I started making drawings of rocks and geology, in particular mountains. And in the same way that he wrote this poem about the mountain where he's from, I've revisited places that have been important to me. So these are, these are two very big pen ink drawings, which were part of a show I did in, in the Isle of Man, about a geological feature in the Isle of Man called the, the, uh, the, the Drinking Dragon. And for all intents and purposes, when you see this at a certain angle, it does look like a drinking dragon. And this idea about the phenomenology of certain rocks and places uh, fascinates me. Um, and I've, I've made, it, up, up, it's been a, a part of my practice over the past few, few years is just go, going to these places, revisiting them. And I'll show you a little, a little bit of some of the stuff that's in here in the studio just now that, that echoes that. Um, next one, please. And these are some drawings from a show I did just a couple of years ago down at MIMA, the Middle, Middlesbrough Institute of Modern Art. Um, and and this, this is actually maybe the next slide as well. This is a feature which was uh, affectionately known as the Elephant Rock in Hartlepool. Um, and uh, it was immortalized um, by, by Victorian painters and film, uh, sorry, photographers. Um, uh, sadly, it was washed away in a big storm uh, but when I was invited to do an exhibition down, I thought it wouldn't be nice to revisit the site of the Elephant Rock and make some drawings and in a sense re revisit the idea of the Elephant Rock. So I've made a, I've made a series of other drawings about those types of geology, the, the notion of something that's been there and something that's lost. Um, and uh, these, these are very large pen ink drawings, um, which are, are done on Fabriano paper. Again, I'll show you some other stuff here in the studio in a second. Okay, next one, please. And this is just another shot, um, giving an idea about the, the, the scale of the drawings. Um, interestingly enough, um, it's kind of sad about the RSA. I have two big drawings which were installed in the RSA for the summer show. Um, one, uh, one was, hang on, what was it? One was a Fingal's Cave and the other one was Sylvan Mountain. And we installed these in the, on two big frames in the main space for the RSA. Um, and then unfortunately lockdown happened and the drawings were in that space all the way through the summer. Um, and, and rather frustratingly, the drawings have kind of, they, they, before the drawings are ever seen public, they're, they're, they're usually re-stretched and repositioned, and that didn't happen. So I think they've been hanging there, literally hanging the RSA all this time, and probably are down now, but it, it, was, uh, it was lovely to see them actually, or for, for an audience to see these big drawings in the space. But this gives you an idea about the type of way that the drawings are usually displayed. The, 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 you know, the, the notion of the big easel, everything's on a grander scale, and it's, it's how we experience those landscapes. Next slide, please. Um, this is just the last one I want to show you. Um, and it, it, just an example of, of what happens in the studio. So if you see the drawing, um, the, the, I was making this, we, we got a lot of thistles out here. Um, and one day the crofter was up um, and uh, he was, I was asking him, why is there so many thistles coming up this year? And he kind of looked at me accusingly, he says, you have disturbed the ground. You have disturbed the ground. And when you disturb the ground, the thistles come. And it was extraordinary. Um, because we'd actually brought plant equipment up here, tractors and everything to, to build the place, the ground had been turned over. And that, that unleashed the, the thistle seeds, which had been dormant for up to about 70 years, I believe. And uh, that then actually allows them to sort of flourish. And so the whole field was full of thistles. That, that really fascinated me that something that's underneath the rock and in the ground can actually thrive in this sort of way. Um, uh, it's about that sort of uh, resilience um, and uh, in, in the fact of I can't say it, well, just determination. Um, but uh, so anyway, I, did, I, made these, I made a set of drawings in the studio, of just big pen ink drawings. I bring the thistles in here. And I, I just stretch a bit of paper and, I, and these are all pen ink drawings um, using a, a brush, a wee thin brush on a big long stick. And uh, one day there was this incredible bang. It was like a really kind of monumental bang. And what happened is the paper had actually just split in half. 
So the drawing is over here and I can show you. Um, and I thought, oh shit, okay, right, the drawing, that's it, Banjax. But I'm a great believer in improvisation and just say, well, let's, let's see what else we can do with this. And um, it was kind of, I thought, well, actually, I, I did a work, did the show a few years ago in the tramway about uh, Burns, a Burns Supper. And uh, I thought that, that, that notion of the knife coming through the, the haggis and all that symbolism around that, why don't I try something like this with this drawing? So this was just me again, lurking around with the drawing. And, and this then became the piece. This became the piece. So that's just an example of, and, and, and these drawings can be seen, uh, and the, the prints can be seen as actually either as photo, photo, a process called photopolymer gravure, um, or they can be seen as digital prints, uh, or they can just be as, as drawings in their own right, hanging in, in, a, in an exhibition space. So, um, so should we go back to the, the studio? Yep. And, uh, that was so great. Thank you very much, Keith. That was so interesting. It's, uh, I had a look at your slides earlier, but it's much, much better when you've got your, your voice attached to them. <laughs> um, I, I'd just like to say very quickly, um, because I was on the hanging committee, I was very privileged to see your pictures of uh, Sylvan and Fingal's Cave, even though most of the, of course, all the public didn't get to. And I can confirm to you all that they looked absolutely magnificent. Um, so... But, but it's, um... It is a, it is, you know, we'll, we'll get them out some other time, but it is a challenge actually showing big works and not being there because it, it, I would hate for people to see them in the way they find it because d drawings and paper uh, absorb moisture and humidity and you've got to go back and re-stretch them and so, um, yeah. but I've got, I've actually, I've just got some, some pieces around here. Um, so this gives you an idea of some of the work that I've been making and um, it, this is a, this is a, a, a this is actually a, a, an image of a rock, Marsden rock, which was close to where I used to live down in Newcastle. And the, the rock collapsed um, uh, oh, 20 odd years ago, but um, I had made drawings of it before it collapsed and then this, this entire area. So what I like to do is I go in and this is actually a big lithograph that I made with um, actually Alphonse by Tatus, uh, another great friend of the RSA and member. And Alphonse and I worked together on a number of uh, print collaborations. So the beauty of, of making a number of lithographs is that, uh, it's actually, this is a soul screen one, sorry, this is a soul screen, this one, um, is that we can actually, you know, you, you can, you, you'll have the odd dodgy one where there's a kind of slight error. So, and, and playing with that, and in the end, actually, I much prefer these pieces because of the, um, the, the, the vulnerability of the paper. It echoes, it echoes I suppose, the, the geological feature. Um, here's another shot of me lurking around with uh, what is left. <laughs> Of this is what's left of the um, the Marsden rock. Um, so yeah, lark larking is an incredibly important process. Um, I'll go over here so you can actually see the. Yeah. Um, this is the drawing that I showed you earlier on. Can you see that? Um, I kind of still like this one because of the big the big the big tear going through it. Oh it's yeah. A... Can you just demonstrate the tear? I want to see it. Thank yeah. you very much. Yeah. <laughs> And it, and it did it tear because it was stretched and then it was drying and it didn't have anywhere to go. This, this, this is a, this, so this is a, this is a Fabriano paper. It's a fantastic yeah. Italian paper, one of the oldest paper mills in Europe. Um, and I've been using it for years and years and years now. Um, to be honest, it's the first time it ever happened, but I think it was actually just to do with humidity changes in the new studio. Mm. And so it's, it's something which, yeah, it happened, but, um, it's become like a really important favorite drawing for me. Um, I've got, I've just, I've just got these, these guys are up here just now as well. The, the draw, the building, the church, I really like the fact that the church had been a kind of home and a base for other animals in Ireland. Um, and uh, we, we had a great big um, rook's nest, a fantastic thing up in the roof when we first came here. And then we put the roof on the building, um, the, the rooks kept coming back and actually they can cause quite a lot of damage. But um, but we've got we've kind of we they've not been back in the past year or two sadly but they are um, they're quite impressive birds here man. so I'll start to show you some of the other stuff that's kind of um, some of these other drawings uh, this 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 one behind me I don't know if you can just see this big big pen ink drawing mm. drawing I made following several visits up to Orkney um, of the old man of Hoy and. Um, the old man of Hoy is an absolutely fascinating piece of geology. 
Um, and I was really interested in that notion that we try and immortalize it because it will collapse potentially in the next couple of years. It's, uh, it's yeah, it's, it's, you can see photographs of the old man of Hoy from just a hundred years ago and it was actually attached to the mainland and um, it's, it's rapidly deteriorating. And what, what I'm curious about is the impact that, you know, if this goes, um, it's a bit like when the rock fell down at Marsden Rock, the, the, the community were actually mourning. They'd lost this really important part of their, their, their sort of brand, their identity, their community. And, uh, you know, if you look at this, this extraordinary piece of um, geology up in Orkney, it's been immortalized in so many films, uh, in, in brands, whiskey labels, postcards. Um, it is, a, and if famously, I think back in, well, back in the 60s, it was a subject of a three-day live climb by Chris Bonington, one of the most extraordinary kind of live documentaries. But this, this piece of geology, so, you know, it's, it's, um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a big, a big pen ink drawing. And I've, I've, one of the things I've been doing with some of the projects is encouraging people to think differently about how they might approach um, drawing and, and immortalize these places. I've got, two, I've got two drawings on the go just now, which um, are pretty much nearly done. Um, I'm fascinated, for those who live down the East Coast, this is a, you can't really see it from here. I'll go upstairs and show you. This is the Bass Rock. Um, and I'm, oh, if you can, I'll, I'll, I'll show you that. So, but this one over here is, um, is, is, is Ailsa Craig. Um, and uh, over when I taught at Glasgow School of Art, we used to have a, a summer trip. Um, the Glasgow had a fantastic set of studios down at Killeen Castle. And um, this, this big lump was kind of further down, sitting off Girvan. It was an extraordinary piece. Um, I've never actually been on it, but I've been on a few boats going past it. And, um, and so this is a kind of tribute. Well, I'm just noticing the light is really starting to go here now. Um, so that's, that's a big, big drawing of uh, just a, the most recent drawing I've made. Um, of, of, Keith, what, yeah. what medium is that drawing? It's all black ink. It's just black. All black ink, yeah. yeah. I'm going to go a wee bit closer so you can see them. A sure. bit. That's good. And is it, uh, uh, yeah, it's very interesting. How how do you find it sort of trying to because I, I I understand this whole thing about working in a large scale you know that thing of trying to maintain the sense of the whole and yet move into the detail at the same time do you find that having this large studio is so helpful because you can get back from it and do you spend a lot of time moving back and forth between it how how does it how does it work for you it's, um, it's a really important part of that process that. Mm -hmm. The, 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 to be honest, the drawings don't take any bigger than if they were, say, about a, 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 a two size or so, because it's just to do with you work on a bigger scale, it's more physical. Mm. Uh, but the, you're right, it's not about that sort of, uh, about the sense of, 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 of building up the drawing and kind of using these kind of, which are pretty traditional cross-hatching techniques. And I'm really interested in that way that you can follow the topography of line. Mm. Um, I, I'm, actually you get close up you know it starts to kind of um it starts to all have form and everything and the smallest of marks can can have a big impact yes. and um, uh, i'll tell you what i'll do is i'll go upstairs and i'll show you this guy um okay. the, the, the 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 new one um Oh, this is this is a good view for everybody. We like this view. That's fantastic. So, um, wow, what a space! Yeah, the top, the top bit. This actually, she'll probably kill me, but this is, uh, this is, this is, this is where Sheena has her studio up here. Um, so she's got this view out there, um, and uh, so this is, this is, she works here, and then um, over here, this is a sort of in the studio space. It's a this is a kind of chill out sort of uh, space, but due to COVID, my son and his partner have set up their office here. So, <laughs> picked out. And, and another thing about COVID, they don't like my music. Um, oh, no. no, they don't like Shostakovich for some reason. <laughs> um, I'm just showing you this, this drawing. Maybe this is a, can you see that okay? I can't. Yeah, hold, hold it still for a minute there and just don't move the computer just for a minute. So yeah. we can all get a really nice gaze at it, Keith, because yeah, it's one of the things with this is we just like to have a little minute to contemplate. So just hold it there. 
Oh, do you know, for me, it's so fascinating seeing the work in progress. And I really feel this is a, such a privilege because it gives us a really good insight into your approaches and, 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 and where you're choosing to make your marks. And I can just feel the whole right hand side of those buttressed rocks, which have been worn away with the, you know, with the wind and the waves and so on, holding up that, that surface. It's just, just fantastic. And, and I think the thing is as well, it's, it's everyone's got their own, I know that the painter John Houston had a massive love affair with this part of the world and particularly the Bass Rock and, and John Bellany as well. It's, it was just always there and it's a, it's a kind of signifier of place. Um, it's really important that, and I think, you know, whether it's, um, you know, I've, I've made a number of drawings of these places of Scottish geology, which are kind of, again, they're, 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 they are, they are defining places and they will be there for millennia, hopefully. Oh, well, maybe not. If it's, a, if it's like the old man of Hoy. I think there's a really interesting relationship between something which seems so monumental and yet has this sort of relationship with ephemeral, you know, the ephemeral, like, like you know, what's that one that you, the, the rock in, that you said collapsed found down yeah. south of the East Coast. Um, and, and then, of course, the old man of Foy. Um, Robbie's just come in with an interesting uh, comment about um, Ailsa Craig, um, mm. that, that the granite is, is so hard and so strong that it's used for curling stones and it's only mined every 10 years. Which, yep. is, which is fascinating, isn't it? I mean... Actually, this, this is my favourite view from the studio. Um, I don't know if you can just see that one. Mm -hmm. uh, up here. Uh, because when we designed this, this kind of, this, this, this shape, I was working on a theatre project and um, I, uh, I, was, I, I had this idea about putting everything on a gigantic uh, piano lid. And, uh -huh. and when I had the, the theatre model, I always make models when we were doing it. I don't sadly don't have any here just now. But I make a model and anyway, I had two piano lids and they happened to just be sitting on top of one another um, in this particular area. And I thought, wow, that, that, that way that line takes your eye around. So, so um, uh, Derek Pageants and I, we kind of oh. played with this and, the, and the, this, this has become like a, a like a, my favourite vista where you can go all the way through and the, your eye is constantly being moving around. And mm. then you have this big solid, this is the big solid drawing wall. Yeah, way. I love it. I'm, I'm, I'm having studio envy here, Keith. This is really not fair. I was quite happy with my studio until I saw yours. That's really terrible. Well, <laughs> nice. It was really, it was really, 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 kind of really um, excited. Because, well, the Channel 4 guys made a documentary about the studio. Um, yeah, so it was really... A lot of people coming up to see the building because of that. Mm -hmm. uh, but the, the other thing is they were very lucky in that we received an RIS award for the studio. So that's, that was um, great about a collaboration like that uh, mm. getting recognized, so. Uh, um, Keith, can I ask you um, questions? Um, uh, you know how you've got this, um, you talked about the fishbone roof. Yeah. That, 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 and, and does the curve of the balcony echo that yeah. roof? Yeah, you can just see the, the, the roof here. It, um, it's, sort of, it's probably as difficult to explain this in this light, but the roof actually sort of just swells round. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, um, it's probably, it's better actually seeing it in daylight funnily enough. Um, so that's, that's just a sense of some of the things that I've been doing. Um, actually, here's another one of these uh, larking pieces. This is a, a I, was, I was invited to do a show um, uh, with the Dunbeath Heritage Museum, which is a beautiful place up in Caithness. And I'm very interested in the work of Neil Gunn, the writer. Oh, and yeah. Neil Gunn's school and the heritage of the Neil Gunn Trust. They very kindly sort of arranged for me to stay in his house when I was up there, um, which is right beside the river, the famous river that we featured in Highland River. And um, it was a, a great pl privilege to do that. Unfortunately, it's the coldest house I've ever stayed in in my life. <laughs> Uh, um, Where about is that? In, up in Caithness, yeah, right up there. Yeah, yeah. when you're driving up, um, you go over a great big bridge and Dunbeath is kind of to your left. Oh, and oh yeah. But um, it is a, an extraordinary place. It's a beautiful museum, a fantastic museum, and they have a big gun archive there. So they invited me to do an exhibition. And I made a series of works for that. And this is one that I've kind of revisited 
uh, just me larking around with two big drawings of salmon with my son. Uh, I call this one parental guidance. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, again, <laughs> it's that sense of, of, of pulling people in and, and, um, and imp improvisation is critically important. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I try and get students, it's one of the big drivers when I'm working with students, say, you know, don't, don't, do, don't know what you, don't do what you know already, do something that's kind of, that's different and you'll and yeah. do it differently and uh, you'll be surprised what you can achieve. I'm, I'm, I'm really fascinated by um, your relationship with animals. I mean, I see that, you know, you have, you have the, 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 the influence of just looking at natural form from within animals. And I like the way it sort of, for me, I'm looking at all these different links because I mean, just for instance, you've got the old man of Hoy, which it, you know, it's, it, it's, it stands for both kind of that iconographic thing, like you say, the labels on whiskey bottles, and in a couple of years it might have collapsed and disappeared into the sea. And it is actually only a continuous process of erosion. And our little tiny ephemeral lives are just nothing compared to these rocks, but even the rocks change. Um, but, but so many, I think you're, you're kind of hooked into that relationship between the geology with architecture, but also, the kind of narrative of animals and animal lives. And I'm, I'm very interested in how you, you, you really reflect something very, very, what I think of as primitive in the way that so many people look at a rock and they attach an animal to it. And, and um, you know, I, I worked in China a lot recently, you know, the last 10 years, and, and they do this as well. It's a really big thing that, that although our species around the world are disappearing at a horrendous speed, um, we attach animals to, you know, like the Great Wall of China has a bit of it that's called the Dragon Wall and the Tiger Wall, depending on how it follows the geology. And you have the elephant rock and, and so on. And what else? There was something else. Um, there's the, um, wasn't the giraffe, it was um, the dragon. You had a dragon. Did you have a dragon as well? I've got the, the dragons not here, the dragons, the, but there was a big show that I did about the, um, about the dragon. What was fascinating about that show, um, uh, we made a film as well, which uh, is, is, uh, is, is a nice piece because it was actually done all in Manx Gaelic. Mm -hmm. And uh, Manx Gaelic has actually had basically disappeared. And it's a very, very different, so it was more like a Gaelic, it's like between Irish Gaelic and, and Welsh, although others would say differently, but mm. it's a beautiful language, but it almost like literally disappeared. It become extinct itself um, and, and there's a combination of finding that and the dragon which has got the dragon's got an amazing it's a piece of limestone it's got a huge big fracture going through it so it too will actually collapse at some point yeah but the idea of com combining that language and and we did this show over there and what I did was I did the exhibition um, uh, first and invited people to respond to the exhibition we did a kind of conference where we brought Gaelic speakers together musicians writers and, and I invited people to respond to the rock. M most people had never seen the rock before because you've got to go out to, out to sea and, and go to a particular vista to see the dragon effect. But fishermen know about it. So when people went out in the boat and they saw it, it was like, oh my God, that's on our doorstep, we didn't know. How so I then, I then said, so, well, you respond to it. And at the end of the year, I got this absolutely staggeringly beautiful poem from an Indian, an Indian writer um, Usha Kishore, who'd actually moved to the Isle, uh, Isle of Man. And she wrote this beautiful, beautiful poem about the rock in response to my drawings. So we then took her poem and made it translated into Manx Gaelic and then put into this film. So that sort of uh, journey and pathway of different collaborations of, of, um, of surprises, um, all, that, all that was kind of, was part and parcel of the project. And, um, so kind of that goes back to a lot of the theatre the stuff I've done where you're working with writers and musicians and actors, mm. lighting designers and, you know, carpenters, that you're part of a kind of collaborative team. And uh, I've, I've always found that to be, and, and the same goes with working with students. You know, I find working in art schools has been the most inspirational thing because you never know what's going to emerge. And it's that sense of surprise, surprise. Yeah. Mm. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, do, do do you do you miss the 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 gang down in Northumberland, or have you have, have, are you tied up now wonderfully with your University of the Highlands and Islands? I mean, how's so, that 
thing. Again, if anyone knows Newcastle and Gateshead and, and the North East, there's been a massive transformation in terms of the um, arts and cultural scene there. Um, and, uh, you know, it was just great to see one of the things that happened was that artists decided to stay. Artists didn't feel they had to leave Newcastle, they wanted to stay and there was resources there and there were studios, there was galleries, there was a community of practice for them. And that's something which is really important. And uh, so, so the people I keep in touch with down there, yes, hope that I work with artists, but actually the students, the graduates who are still there in their studios making work. Um, and, and maybe the one thing that, that, that could be good for the, the northeast of England, and I've said this, is that they have their own type of academy that supports, you know, graduates, because that's one of the things I'm always been, I was, a, I was, I was hugely um, grateful to the RSA supporting me when I was a student, um, mm. the Sir William Gillis Award and a couple of other things, and that helped me travel and see things. And what was wonderful is like, the RSA, when you do something like that, they just sort of say, oh, let us know how you got on. There's no kind of big pressure about delivering something. It's mm. about you just having your imagination, you know, and, and being free to go and explore. Um, so that, that was another really important part of, of my growing up. Oh, Keith, it's really, it's really wonderful to hear that from you because I, I feel like that about the RSA. And I think, um, you know, in these, these days, everything, everyone feels under terrible stress with the COVID times and with our isolation and everything. And, and I feel like, you know, you, you are representing the end of really what has been quite an amazing series of um, six different visits to artist studios. And I feel there's something really important emerging, which bizarrely is, is that sense of community. And, and, and I think you exemplify that sense of community in the art world and in and, and the arts world. You know, like, like that we're not, we're not existing in isolation. The galleries can give an idea that, that the visual arts exist separate from everything else. But I, I can very much see how comfortable you are with letting so many different things <coughs> into your life and making the connections across the arts. And, and I think that has to happen right across Scotland. I'm sure you'll agree. Um, and, and, and the RSA, I, I feel is really dedicated to representing practices right from every single corner and, and that that extends across the world. Uh, one of the amazing things with Zoom is that I'm, I think we have people here from all over. And, and uh, if I see there's someone from, um, uh, we're from Philadelphia uh, in tuning in as well, which is wonderful. And uh, so, you know, we have, uh, we have, uh, and that's from um, CS Novak to everybody. Hi, Keith, Carol from Philly. Studio is looking oh, very oh, full and soulful. <laughs> so there we go. <laughs> and we also have from Sarah. I love the fact that you are so perceptive to the land and the people of Burnery and able to communicate through your amazing draftsmanship and and you know there's this real sense of 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 things moving out and i think i think if there's anything you'd like to sum up with we might then open the floor to some questions how does that seem to you you mentioned earlier on that you know i left i left northumbria university um uh, well two and a half years ago now and it'd been a great time i had 10 years before that at glasgow school of art and saw glasgow you know, emerge um, really, really extraordinary kind of cohort of artists come out then, and uh, and 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 actually at this stage of my career, the opportunity to work with the new University of Highlands and Islands. It's a university only ten years old, but we've got an art school now in Ty um and, and and we had our first full cohort of students going through last year, and it's a small art school, probably the smallest art school in in the UK, but it sits in an island community. Um, people come here, artists. I tell you one of the absolute gems that I love about being here. On a Saturday morning, Chris, who's our postman, who's probably, you know, about 65 or so, Chris comes in with a post and he brings his portfolio of drawings. And he lays his draw and they're big drawings, and he lays them out here. And, and we have these kind of discussions about his drawings. And, and I, I think last year I had a visit from uh, Fiona Dean, uh, who's oh, in there, yeah. Fiona and uh, Paul Cosgrove, the, the sculptor. Mm -hmm. They were here staying in the studio for a few days. And Saturday morning, they were sitting having a cup of coffee. And then comes the postman with his drawings. And they just sat in silence. And, and then I invite them, do you want to help give them a critique? 
So you had, it was just, like, and they were just like pouring coffee in their face thinking, wow, what a place this is, that the post <laughs> is also making art. And, 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 and the crofter here could sing songs and, you know, it's that sense of being part of a living culture, a living culture. It's not about, you know, heritage as tends to be, it's a living culture now. Yeah. So I find that, I find that quite, um, yeah, that's a big driver in a lot of things I, I want to do next. And I, I'll just say one thing is that um, it's this, this COVID thing's been actually quite tough here. And I'm showing you this nice studio and people are going, oh, yeah, yeah, wonderful. I'd love to, you know, da, da, da. No, it's tough. I, I, find, it, I find it really hard to work here because it's, in fairness, my wife and I are happy one together, but my son works for a Canadian sea plant company, so he's upstairs. So I've got Canadians coming in all the time, booming into the space on their, on their Zoom meetings, and then his partner works for the crofting agency, so she's talking to crofters online all over the phone about filling in form B126. It's just doing my head in. So what I've done is, you can't see it, there's an old Nissan hut on the <laughs> So I've now moved into the Nissan hut to start some new paintings. And it's, it's really, really interesting because I think these paintings, um, and I've not, I'm not showing you them yet, uh, but these paintings, I think, do kind of capture the essence of being on this island now. So I'll hopefully but, maybe but, show them in the RSA. But Keith, I'm going to make a deal with you. Like, you know, like, if we have, if we have to keep doing these Zoom things, you know, or if, if the friends of the RSA are lucky enough to actually go there in real life, I think we're just going to kind of come back to you next year. And next year, we're going to be in the Nissan hut, okay? The Nissan hut. The Nissan hut is the future. Yeah, that's it. I know. Well, there you go. And, and, and then, or maybe you'll have kicked everybody out of your space by then. We'll see. We, I mean, but there's one thing for sure. Um, none of us have had any idea how we're going to, you know, how we've managed to keep going. And I think the fact that you're making art at all, I, I mean, I, like I have my 94 um, year old mother staying with us and she was with us during lockdown and she's come back for some respite care and we have a great time, but you know, that, that we all had that, that just keeping making art is so demanding. You know, we, there has to be so much discipline, doesn't there? It really, it really is a discipline. What, what, um, you don't, what you don't see sometimes in the studio is the day-to-day -day practice. You know, the thing I always like is the routine. Mm. Uh, and as I say, I, I, I'm actually quite badly deaf and I like to play music and my particular music, which might not be um, anyone, anyone else's music, particularly as I play it at particular times of the day when I'm working. Mm. Uh, and and uh, in here, I can play it very, very loud. But um, it's, it's just not conducive to other people working. And likewise, the noises that they were. So it is a really important thing about that routine of studio culture. Yeah. And, and, you know, some, some artists like to be, and I think you see this when you're a student, you know, you, you can tell when you go around an art school, the studios that are buzzing because there's a kind of chemistry amongst the people. And it's just, you oh, yeah. expect things to happen there. And it's that chemistry that when people leave and they've got to get their own spaces and work on their own, it can be quite tough, it can be very tough. Um, so I think getting that studio culture right, and that's the, one of the things we're doing with the UHI just now is we're, we're looking at the islands, there's very, very little studio provision in the Western Isles, virtually none here. We've got some in Thai Kersa, our lovely studios, but not enough for the amount of artists here. Um, there's one WASP studio, one space for the whole of Shetland. Um, and a uh, small studio, beautiful studio space in, in Stromness for Orkney, but it's not enough for the amount of artists that are, that, are, that are here that need space. So that's the next kind of project we're working on just now. Yeah, well, I think you just have to make sure that you manage to um, hijack enough space for yourself at the same time. <laughs> But we all know that one. <laughs> anyway, I would I just like to say thank you so much. It's just been brilliant. Um, I feel really like we've had such a great insight into your practice, into your life, into your concerns and everything. I'm very much looking forward to seeing the work in real life right up close to it. When, when you, if I go back to this thing about this space, uh, no, I know most, most other artists are the same, we wouldn't let anyone, I would not in my old studio, I wouldn't let my family anywhere near it. But when we did this, um, there was a bit of a deal, uh, my father, my mother, my mother passed away and uh, she 
uh, before she passed away, she said, well, leave me a bit of money to, to buy herself a second-hand car. And that was the deal. And I said, I don't want to talk about this. And then she passed away and then I had enough. She left me enough money to buy a second-hand car. And, and, and that I decided to put into, into something that was more substantial. And, and so we did this. Um, and it just, this was this was this was bought relatively cheaply uh, as a as a as a ruin. Um, but the deal with my father helped me. He said, I said, "Why don't you do what you know? Make this a kind of place for artists to come and uh, for artists to use." That's why we, we do frequently have artists visiting here. Um, it's why we we frequently have musicians recording here. So it's a, it's a very it's, it's another reason why I'm moving into this Nissan hut. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it's uh, but it is it is a place. So I, I would, if anyone's ever up this way, please call them. There's also a cup of tea or something. So that is so cool. Um, your your generosity uh, of spirit shines through, Keith, and um, it, it's it's a real inspiration. And 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 I can't thank you enough for letting us all come and visit your studio this evening. I think. Um, and, and I hope the Nissan Hut project goes well. And I, I can I can understand that thing about you you share your space and you go, hang on a sec, I just need a little bit more just at the the hiding away space. Um, <laughs> I hope that works really well for you. Um, as um, I think we could just all join together and say thank you very much indeed. And um, Oh, is, have we got any other questions or are we all good? I think we're good for tonight. And 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 I'd like to say to everybody that um, we're going to welcome, We're gonna, this is the end of our first series of live at the Academician Studio. I would love to say that lockdown is over and that we can all go back to visiting real artist studio. But alas and alack, I think we're already developing series number two, which Elena, I think it's going to start in a couple of months, is that right? Uh, yeah, so we'll have some other digital events, but uh, probably the Academician Studio will be back in November. Fantastic. So yeah. we look forward to welcoming you all back then. Thanks a million. That's great.